mode. Hi, welcome to our webinar. We will be talking about how to reduce your crud with uh, John Wish and looking at uh, two possible solutions to uh, doing that. One is Data Manager, uh, which is a non-object oriented solution, and the other one is the ColdFusion ORM uh, that's built into ColdFusion 9 and 10. So uh, I will be uh, handing over to John Wish in a moment. He's here joining us from England. And uh, John has written a book on ColdFusion ORM, and he's been working on ColdFusion since version 4.5 many years ago. And he's also spoken at CF Objective and Scotch on the Rocks on several occasions. So uh, take it away, John. OK, thank you. Um, I'm guessing you can all see my screen now. So without further ado, I guess we shall get started. So first of all, uh, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. I guess so there might even be some good mornings. Um, as Michael just said, this is a presentation about um, trying to speed up your development by using some of the existing tools that we're able to do a uh, large amount of the, what we call the CRUD operations. Um, so, let's get going. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Okay, so let's have a look at what we're going to be covering. Um, well, I've already used an acronym already, and that's CRUD. So the first thing is what actually is that? And then we're going to look at Data Manager, which is an open source application, which you can download and use in your applications. Um, and then there's ORM, which as Michael said, is built into both Rhino and ColdFusion now. Um, and then I'm going to have some resources later, which you can go and look at in your own spare time if you're interested. And then we'll have a Q&A session at the end. Um, what I'll do is I'll run through the slides and I'll, I'll ask you to save any questions at the end, um, if that's okay. So, what is CRUD? CRUD, according to Wikipedia, is create, read, update and delete a basic functions of system storage. Um, this is a pretty good description. In SQL terms, that's obviously insert, select, update, and delete. But I guess they felt that CRUD was more catchy than ISERT, so they went with that one. The thing about CRUD is it's incredibly repetitive, time-consuming, and really, to be honest, quite boring writing all these SQL statements by hand. So what we tend to do is look for things like Data Manager or ORM to act as our, what we call the DAO, which is a data access layer, so it's just a fancy name for abstracting away your, your persistence in the database. Um, and first of all, we're going to look at data manager, and then later on we'll look at ORM. The advantage of obviously using um, libraries that already exist is that they've done huge amounts of code writes for you. They've been in the wild. All the bug tests have already been found and fixed. So you don't have to worry about that side of things. So um, I, I'm kind of curious what people are currently using for uh, DAL, um, and I have a poll on that. So let's uh, see what people are currently using, whether it's Data Manager or CFORM, or maybe even Transfer or Reactor, or maybe you don't do it, you're just using straight SQL or uh, store procedures uh, to access your data. So um, if you can go ahead and vote on that poll, and it looks like we're getting lots of votes in there. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll in three, two, one, and close the poll. And um, looks like uh, most people uh, on the webinar uh, are just using straight SQL, but we do have uh, some folks uh, using ORM and Data Manager as well. And that sounds uh, somewhat similar to the uh, CF State of the Union survey we did. Um, where about uh, two-thirds of people weren't using uh, DAL currently. Okay, so um, we're going to start off with Data Manager, as I said. Um, data Manager is a project that's created by our very own Steve Ryan. He's done a lot of open source projects. Um, I've been using the rooms, so perhaps not to use Steve. Um, it's been around since 2006, so it's been out in the wild for a long time. It obviously has gone through revisions in that time, but you know, it's out there, it's proven, it's tested. It works with ColdFusion MX 6.1 and higher, 
aren't RIDO3. So if you are on Cold Fusion 9 or the latest RIDO, then data management is still an option you should be looking at. It's based on a SIF crew record set. Um, that might sound obvious to you, but if you haven't looked at IRMs before, then I'll show you those that will make a bit more sense. But basically, if you're used to using CF Query, the data manager is, will be very easy to fit into your workflow because you'll be familiar with how it works. Um, and finally, so I know this is important to some people, is that the, um, the license is under is the LGPL license. Um, so you're pretty much free to do what you like with it. So, how do you use it? Well, first of all, you need to go and download it. Um, in my resource section at the end, I'll give you links to that. Um, but you treat it as an object, so you need to instantiate it. Um, here I'm using the create object syntax, but obviously from the newer engines you can just use the new keyword. And pretty much the only argument you need to pass it in is the data source name, which you can put up in the end there. Um, data Manager is actually pretty clever in that it can actually go off and detect the type of database engine you're using, um, and it works with all the usual suspects, such as Oracle and Microsoft SQL Server, MySQL, uh, but it also actually works with Access if you want to use Access. Um, so that's, I know some people use that, um, and it's quite useful to know that it does support that. Data Manager should be treated as a singleton. If, um, singleton basically means there is only one in your application. So once you've created it, use that reference to it, then go off and create lots of versions of it. Um, obviously, if you're more familiar with sort of using other libraries like ColdSpring or something like that, you can plug it into ColdSpring. There's no reason why you can't do that. Um, but for simplicity, I've just started straight in the application side here. Um, well, although I'm using CF um, script syntax, you can obviously use it with the old tag to start syntax if you prefer. I just like what I write my code in the script. So, first part of CRUD is create. And there is how you do it with Data Manager. So, there's a method in there called insert record. And then you pass in the table name, and then a struct of data. And what that will do is it will just return the primary key of the record that's been inserted. So if we look at an actual code example of that, here we are, I've got a countries table in my database. I want to go and create a new country called El Dorado, so we can go and find the dog. Um, so there's a struct in there, which I've created called my country. And I'm just passing that straight into insert record as a second argument. Because data manager uses structs, then you could actually, if you wanted to, just pass in something as simple as your form struct into there. Um, probably you'd want to uh, check your data and validate it before you do that, but it's, it's as simple as using that. Um, I put on the slide that outputs one, two, three, but obviously you know, that would depend on what your database engine would produce. So once we've got the data into there, we obviously want to be able to get it out. So that's where the read part comes in. So data manager has a method called get records, as you would expect, very similar pattern. You add the table name and then a struct, which is actually the filter of what you want to get out of the database. And that will return our good old favorite CF query object. So here's an example. If I wanted to get all the countries that were active and taxable, I'd pass in a filter like that and it will return a record set. And there you are, there's a very simple example of what you can actually get out from that. So in the space of uh, two lines, you've actually done a huge amount of what you would have had to type up and create, um, and pretty much you would have got that up and running as fast as I've um, done the slides. Um, something I should point out, which might not be obvious, is that when I created the um, data manager in the application CFC, I didn't need to tell it any of my tables or anything like that. What data manager can do is it'll actually go off and um, introspect the database and find out what the tables are and things like that. So getting it up and running is pretty much what I have shown you so far. Um, you don't need to go off and create any sort of uh, definitions of your tables or your database or anything like that. So moving on, update. Again, nice sensible naming convention. Update record. I'm sure you're familiar with the pattern by now. Table name, past instructed data. 
Okay. And what this will do is update one record in your database and it will return the primary key. So here's a good example of how you would do it. So I've got the country as a struct, which has got TCNet ID code and title. So if I wanted to change my El Dorado country, if I found out it suddenly didn't exist, and actually really it's just the same as Atlantis, this is the country I would, uh, this is the code I would use. So there we have primary key, which tells obviously data manager which record in the database to update. And then the other fields are, sorry, the other fields are just telling data manager what you want the new values to be. Um, and then it returns the one, two, three at the end. Okay. I did discover when I, um, sorry, skipping ahead of myself briefly now. So looking at um, the delete method, what delete does is it deletes one record at a time from your database. It's a table name filter. Um, this time it doesn't actually return anything, it returns a void. Um, so passing it in as simple as that, my country, the ID, and it will go off and delete that record. If you don't pass the primary key in, um, the ID, then you will get a, um, an error, it just throws an error. If you pass and struct with more keys, it'll just ignore the other keys. It just looks for the, what, um, the key that matches the column name in the table. Um, so obviously in this example, I have a country table and there's a column in there called ID. If your um, primary key field is called um, countries underscore PK, then you would need to pass in the key of countries underscore PK equals one, two, three. So there you are. That's the basics of using CRUD with Data Manager. But don't be, um, don't think that that's all Data Manager can do. So it does a whole bunch of other things, and I'm not actually going to cover them all. But I just wanted to show some of the ones that are quite cool. So save record. Earlier, when we um, looked at the earlier slides, we had the, the create slide, and we also did an update. But quite often, you want to just insert the data into the database or update the record. You don't want to necessarily have to check if that record exists. And this is what save record is designed for. So again, using a fairly familiar naming convention, you pass in table name and a struct of data, and that will return the primary key. So here, what I want to do is I want to save the record of Atlantis. Now I haven't actually specified the primary key here. So what data manager will do is it will go and look at the database and match on all the columns that you pass it in. If it doesn't find any matches, it will create a new record. If you do pass in the primary key as a, ID, um, as a key in your struct, then it will just match on the primary key. It won't look at the other fields. This, obviously, if you're using a database that had um, self-generated primary keys, um, so they were auto-incrementing or something like that, then you wouldn't be able to use the save record because you wouldn't know what the ID was. Um, so it's useful to know that you can just pass in a structured data and ignore the primary key and it will handle that all for you. So, deleting records. I often find that um, quite often you will be deleting one record at a time, but it's still very useful to be able to delete a whole bunch of records at the same time. Uh, and that's what the delete records method is for. So, there we go. Table name, structured data. This returns void, so it returns nothing. So in this example, I want to delete all the countries in my table, my countries table, that match code of 80 in title of Atlantis. So data banish your girl can find all the records that match that, basically in the where clause, and just go off and delete them. So update records, very similar principle. So there you have. Um, similar to the update record, but we're passing in a obviously you update records. We've got table name, struct, and a filter. Now the reason why we've got a third argument is obviously you want to be able to match um, the record you want to update and then pass in the new data. So that's why you've got a third argument there. Um, again it returns forward. So here's an example of actually using that. Um, so we've got the new data, 
we found out that Lance doesn't exist, and we want to call it Xanadu instead in our database. So what happens is we're going to pass in the new data and the filter. So the new data will be what it's updated to, and the filter will be the matches it looks for in the database. So we're just going to basically update any of the records, which are currently at AT and Atlantis, and replace them with XU and Xanadu. Now in my example, I've got um, code and title on both of those um, structs that I'm passing in, but they could be anything you like, those, those columns. It doesn't actually have to be the same. I just chose to do that in my example. So I could um, actually make all active records in the database Xanadu if I wanted to. So, though we've looked at um, getting records out of the database, obviously sorting data is a useful thing to be able to do. So here's an example of getting all the active countries, sorting by code and then by title. So the third argument is basically your order by clause. And again, that's going to return a record set that we're familiar with. Another thing that's quite common is being able to do paging. Um, so this is an example where you pass in the maximum numbers of rows. Obviously here I want to get 10 out, and the offset is 10, so it's going to start with the 20th record. So it's kind of like page 2, showing 10 on each. Um, you can see that I've got um, the second argument being passed into there as an empty struct. This is because I want to return everything, so I'm just not passing any uh, keys to filter on. And I've also got um, a descending column there. So active descending and title. So just as you would if you were writing this through manually, what you your display statement is saying. So that's a quick overview of what Data Manager does. Um, as I say, it does a lot more, and I would encourage you, if you like this, um, the idea of what you've seen, is to go off and look at Steve's website where he's actually got um, a little playground where you can go off and try different things. Um, it's also full documentation and things like that, um, which is very good. Um, and you can also do things like table creation with Data Manager. So imagine you've got a database where you want to add a new table to it. Um, traditionally, you would create a SQL statement, which would have you know, your create table in it and all the rest of it like that. You'd log on to your production server. You would go and run that against your database. Um, if you wanted to, Data Manager can actually do that for you. You basically create a uh, definition of how the table is. Um, that's actually done with an XML schema, which isn't as scary as it sounds if anyone's anti-XML in the audience. Um, and then you can actually get Data Manager to create that table if it doesn't exist for you, which is a very nice way of being able to roll out um, updates to uh, development environments. You might be a bit more sort of, um, scared of doing it on production, but certainly in development or around your team, if you've got a bunch of team members and things like that, they can just run it and off it will go. So that's good. Schema updates, um, I've just mentioned table creation, but equally it's, you would want to be able to um, add columns to your database. So the schema updates can do that. You'll add columns in for you, which is great. So again, you can do a similar sort of thing. Um, and then finally, another feature which is quite powerful is soft deletes. Um, what soft deletes are, if you haven't heard the phrase before, is quite often you don't like to actually delete the data from your database, you just want to make it appear as if it's deleted. Um, so for archiving purposes, you might want to keep it in there. And what soft deletes are is they're basically a way of flagging the records as deleted, so that when you run your um, read statements and things like that, it doesn't show those records anymore. It's just as if they've been deleted, but actually they're really still there. Okay, so I'm going to move on to ORM now. Great, thanks, uh, John. That was great uh, info on Data Manager. I'm kind of curious uh, what different databases people are using because you said Data Manager lets you switch uh, database. So um, I yes. put up a poll now. Uh, if you can check off what databases you use, SQL Server, Oracle, MySQL, Access, or something else. And um, I see people are voting in the poll. And we're going to close it in a few seconds. Close it in three, two, one. Final vote. And let's see what people are using. 
well, looks like SQL Server is by far the most used database by people on this webinar, uh, closely followed by Oracle and MySQL. And uh, there are still folks using Access on production uh, uh, servers, so that's kind of interesting. I personally wouldn't recommend that if you've got a high volume of traffic, but maybe uh, other people have different mileage. Okay, so let's go on to uh, ColdFusion ORM. Okay. Um, by the way, I'm, I'm not actually keeping my eye on the chat, so if anyone's getting really bored by me or can't hear me particularly well, then please um, type into the chat and my phone is watching it, so people step in and kick me. Uh, yeah, I have my virtual foot on, under Steve's desk, so <laughs> ready to kick him. And uh, if you have any questions you want to ask uh, about Data Manager or ColdFusion ORM or just database problems in general, put them into the chat and we'll have a Q&A at the end. Okay, so um, next we're going to move on to CLF ORM. Um, I'm afraid there's a bit of bad news for all those people who said they use Access in that CLF ORM does not support Access. Um, I have seen people try to use it and it kind of works, but it it's a bit flaky um, and it's not officially supported, so you might want to look at switching to a different database engine, which is probably a good idea in fact anyway, but yeah, we all have our, our issues we have to deal with, so I'm sure there's a reason why you're using access. So. Um, anyway, so ORM, the mighty ORM. The ORM stands for Object Relational Mapping. Um, that is kind of a scary phrase. Um, it doesn't really impress people at dinner parties that much, so I wouldn't bother churning it out. But basically what that means is when you write your code, you if you want to use objects, um, then what ORM does is it maps those objects to the database. So the ORM layer is responsible for getting the data out of the database, populating your um, objects and equally when you um, populate those objects with data from forms and things like that then it can save them, update them, delete them, all the rest of it like that. Uh, so it certainly makes using ORM much, uh, sorry, object oriented code much easier because you don't have to write huge amounts of boilerplate like you used to. Um, so I really like it. Um, well, I have also used data manager in production as well so I don't want to sway you either way on that. Uh, I think it's certainly worth a look as is data management. So ORM has been around since Coalfusion 9 and Rilo 3.3 introduced it as well. Um, and obviously it's still supported in Rilo 4 and Coalfusion 10. Um, it's based on Hibernate which is a Java library um, and that's been around since 2001. Uh, it's widely used in enterprise. They just baked it into Coalfusion. Uh, that's part of that's the JBoss project or the JBoss community. Um, OpenBD doesn't support it, um, whereas Data Manager will run on OpenBD if anyone's using that. So, this is the actual quote that I found on the Adobe site about operating relational mapping. Um, it's not a bad description, uh, but as I said, if you think of it as using objects in your code, then it's the bit that basically handles getting the data in and out of the database for you. So how do you use it? Okay. So here we are, application CFC. Um, if you are using application CFM, then this will work. You will need to use application CFC. Um, data manager will work with application CFM if you want to add uh, application CFC. Um, so all you do is you set the name of your application Normally would. You set the data source, uh, which is a new feature in ColdFusion 9, which actually applies to queries as well. So you don't have to um, put the data source attribute on your queries anymore if you want to, but that ORM uses it as well. And then finally you need to turn the ORM on. By default it's turned off. Um, and it uses the usual data source like you would in the CFRDU, so there's nothing special you need to do in your CFRDU. So mapping. Um, when we looked at the data manager one, it was very simple to do. Um, there is a bit more setup work to do with ORM. And here's an example. 
So using the same countries table I was using with data manager earlier, you can see that I have created a CSC here called country.csc. I need to use the persistent attribute of the CSC to tell it that yes, I want to map this to the database table. I enter the table name. Uh, the reason why I say it's optional on that little caption is because by default, Cold Fusion will map to the name of your CSC. So by default, if I didn't put the table attribute in, it would try to map to a uh, database table called country in my database. But I like to use plural names in my database tables, um, and objects tend to have singular, um, singular, singular names. Uh, I know what I mean. So what I've done is put in the table's attribute, so that it's obvious what's going on. You need to specify an ID. Um, they call it an identifier, but basically it's primary key in database terms. Um, and tell it which column to map to. Again, that's optional. By default, it will map to the same name as the property name. So I could have actually a letter a one up in this example. But if you want to use different column names to what you want your property names to be, then just add the column attribute. And then you have a bunch of properties, um, and these just map directly onto the corresponding column in the database. Uh, again, if I had different column names, say my countries were prefixed with country underscore title, then you just put in column attribute and stick that value in there. So, create. Um, what I've tried to do is go through the examples as they were in Data Manager so you can get a sort of side-by-side -side comparison. Um, so here we are, this is very similar. Similar. We've got a structured data where I'm setting, um, creating Eldorado. Um, so if I use Entity New, and Entity New will return an object. So it's a bit different space management in that it returns an object, it doesn't just save it. Uh, and then you need to call Entity Save to tell uh, Cold Fusion or Rilo to actually save the data that is in that country to the database. It may seem a little weird if you haven't done any kind of object orientated um, persistence type stuff, but you get very used to it very quickly. Uh, the example I just showed you was actually for Rhino 4 and Cold Fusion 10, where you can pass in the structured data as the second argument to enter to new. That was not supporting Cold Fusion 9, so if you're running on Cold Fusion 9, then you would do it like the example at the bottom. So it's a bit more work but you can kind of see what's going on. Um, in case you're wondering where all the set, com uh, set code and set title and active and taxable comes from, then it's because uh, Code Fusion RM will automatically create a get and a set method for each of the properties you have in your CFC. So if you remember in my CFC, I have property called code and title and active. Um, so Code Fusion and Rhino will then create this for you automatically. Finally, entity save is exactly the same down the bottom. Um, they call it implicit setters in case anyone's ever wondering. I've also heard them called simplified. Um, I don't think that's an official term for it. So now that we've got the data into the database, we want to be able to get it out again. So here we are. You use uh, the entity load method and you pass in the name of the entity you want. So again, it's not the name of the database table, it's the name of the entity, and then that filter is the second argument. And what that will do is it actually returns an array of objects. Now, if I'd been more organized, I would have given this screenshot of what that actually looks like, uh, and I apologize that I haven't done that. Um, but basically what you do is you get an array. Obviously, each element in the array is one object, um, and each of those has a getter and setter, so you just loop through the array and call getters and setters on it. So again, it's difficult to use in queries if we're used to that, um, but it's not difficult to use. It's just a different way of doing it. So, update. Here we go. So, we've got another new method here, entity load by PK. Um, that basically means entity load by primary key. So in this example, I'm passing in the country name, that's the entity name, which is country, and then the ID, which corresponds to the primary key in the database. 
and that'll give me a country object populated with the data in the database. Sorry. And then I can call the set title and set code on it, which will update the properties. Now, this is a bit odd, this example, if anyone's wondering. There isn't an int to save on the end, which looks very odd. Um, and it's just kind of the way that Hibernate works. It works on the principle of um, dirty auto-checking. So it knows that the object's been modified, and because it's been object, it assumes that you want to save that modified object. It doesn't do that with new objects because they're not in the database. It's only if you load it from the database and then change any of the properties. So that's, that's one to watch out for because uh, it will catch you out because you're not explicitly telling it to save it, but it will. It's not a problem. It's just something you need to be aware of. Um, and I suspect there may be some questions about that at the end, but right. we'll talk about that if you want to. So deleting the objects. Again, this is different to if you're using straight SQL because you need to load the object first before you can delete it. You can't just tell LRAN to delete an object by its ID. You have to go off and load it. So as I did before with the, the read, I'm loading it. And then once I've loaded it, I call the delete method on it. And that will get rid of it out of the database. So that's the basics of CRUD in Data Manager and in ORM. Obviously, um, what Data Manager did, it does a whole lot more ORM. So we're just going to have a look at some of those. So there's the usual things like being able to sort. So in this example, I've got the filter. So I'm getting all the countries that are active and sorting by the code followed by the title. And that returns an array of objects, remember. Another thing you want to do is paging. That's also supported. So here, loading countries. It's going to return an array. It's, I'm not passing in the second argument as blank struct, but if I want to get all of them, I could pass in the filter if I wanted to. Then I'm ordering by the active descending, then the title, and then I'm passing in my paging parameters. So just like I did in Data Manager, this is the second page of a uh, this being the 10 on each. So that's why it's got offset of 10, and that's the result of 10. So these are some of the other things that RM can do for you. Um, event handling. Event handling is very useful. Um, how many times have you had to do something where you have to do a timestamp on the object when you save it or create it? It's a fairly common thing to do. Um, but it's code that you have to write that you don't really want to write. So you can use things like event handlers to do that, and they will fire at certain stages um, during the persistence process. So there's one for updating data, there's one for inserting data or creating, uh, deleting, and you can do things like that to, um, for example, do an auditing system. Um, I've seen systems where it just um, gets the structure of the data, serializes it to JSON and saves it to a file. So if you wanted to be able to see the history of an object over time, you could actually have it all stored in um, a file or in a database or anything like that. Um, you could also do um, security checking, make sure that person's got security, or set the user who edited it, things like that. There's quite a lot you can do with it. Um, it's quite a useful thing to be able to do. Cascading, this is something else that you might employ at database level, um, but you can also set it up to be working in ORM, because um, ORM supports relationships between tables. So if you took an example of blog, uh, blog, you would have blog posts, and those blog posts belong in categories. So you can set up a cascade so that when you delete the category, it deletes all the associated posts with it. Um, so that's just one thing you can do. Um, I think data manager has cascading, but I'm not entirely sure on that. Uh, inheritance, you can do uh, inheritance between objects so that you can have um, one object which has common properties of all child objects. 
Um, that's something you do a fair amount in object-oriented programming. You see a lot of the examples of it. It's not something I find particularly useful um, for various reasons, but you can do it. So you can get it to map to different uh, database tables and things like that. Um, HQL. HQL start, sounds a lot like SQL because it is. It's basically a way of querying objects in your application instead of the database. So it actually stands for Hibernate Query uh, Language. Um, and that's something that if you want to use LRM applications, it's, you will probably need to learn it because it's very useful. So I promised you some resources. So going back to Data Manager, the place to get it is from RearForge, where you can just download it. Um, Steve's recently updated it to version 2.5, uh, which is the latest and greatest, and all my examples have used 2.5, so I would encourage you to do that one. Documentation, as I said, Steve's done a very good job of writing up the docs, um, so go off and have a look at that. There are also links from there up to the things like the mailing list and to the demos, and I think even some presentations that Steve's done, um, because obviously I have kind of skipped over it because we've got a fairly short amount of time. So definitely go and have a look at that. There's the mailing list, which you can also post to. Steve's on that. So that's the man who created it. I'm sure he can answer all your questions. Uh, and finally, I noticed it was on GitHub. So you can actually go and make pull requests and fork it and do things like that if you want to. So Cocusion RM. Um, there's some videos you can watch on it on Adobe TV. Um, which is quite good. I think Ray Camden did a few, so go off and have a look at those. There's also the Cognition RM Develop Guide. Um, that's a shortened link I put in there, but basically it goes off to the Adobe documentation. Um, I've linked to the version 9 documentation, I think, but it's also on the Cognition 10 site. And that will basically, um, it's quite a good little guide to get you up and running, talk you through various features and things like that, because obviously um, I've glossed over quite a lot of it. I hope I've given you a good taster. Uh, there's a mailing list, which is not run by Adobe. It's kind of run by um, sort of the luminaries in our community. And there's some very small people on there. So if you have a question, I suggest you go up and have a post it in there. I've also linked to the Hibernate documentation um, because although the Adobe documentation is quite good, it documents what the Adobe integration with Hibernate is. So if you want to learn some more about actually what Hibernate can do and the power of it, particularly things like HQL and stuff like that, then the Hibernate documentation is a very good place to learn. Um, and finally, there's, um, there is actually a book which was written by me. So if you're interested in finding out more, you can go there. Um, and the shameless plug is the Great. Thanks, John. Um, I'm, just before we get into the q and I'm kind of curious what versions of Cold Fusion people are running. Um, so let's just run a poll on that, see if people are running Cold Fusion 10 on production or 9, maybe 8 or earlier, or maybe you're not even using Adobe Cold Fusion, you're using Raylo or some other version. So I want to go ahead and vote on that. And um, let's just close that in 3, 2, 1. Last chance to vote. Closing that. And Looks like most people are using CF9. About a third of people are on 10, and a third, third of people are on CF8 or earlier. And uh, my understanding is that Data Manager will work with earlier versions of Cold Fusion, but if you want to use ORM, you've got to be on Cold Fusion 9 or later. Is that right, John? Yes, uh, Data Manager works with Cold Fusion 6.1 and up, um, and ORM is built in from version 9 and up, 9.01. And then for the folks using open source Raylo, um, they can use ORM? Rilo. Or? Yes, I think I think Data Manager supports Rilo 3 and up. Um, certainly 3.3 it definitely works on. And the ORM stuff is baked in from 3.3. Great. Okay. So um, if we're um, going to go... You had something else you wanted to add, John? Or? Oh, I didn't know. I'm oh, sorry, I can't see the polls. But if anyone's using it from Blue Dragon, I did actually mention that that does not support IRM, but will support data management. All right. Great. So we're going to go into the Q&A. So if you have any uh, questions, feel free to put them into the uh, chat window. And uh, we have some questions already. So um, 
got someone who's uh, interested uh, in practical reasons as to why they should use ORM. They, they hear a lot of people saying it's cool to use and it's the hip thing, but like, what's the practical difference when you're programming a database application in Cold Fusion? Um, the main difference is if you want to use objects, then it's a very good way of getting started um, in the object oriented world. Um, if that's your preferred style, it's not a magic bullet. I wouldn't recommend that you write your entire application in ORM. Um, you should use a pragmatic approach. So um, certainly use ORM for large parts of it, but don't, if you're, for instance, using uh, got a reporting engine in your site, do not try and write it in ORM. SQL is the way to go. So yeah, I really like it. I find it very useful. Um, I mean, go off and try it, see how you get on. Um, I hope that's a reasonable answer. Uh, that sounds good to me. And what are your thoughts on why someone would want to use Data Manager instead of ORM if they're interested in uh, getting rid of the CRUD, repetitive coding? Yes. Um, ORM, uh, sorry, Data Manager is obviously very good if you've got an existing application and you want, you're doing maintenance on it and you um, are adding new functionality, you can kind of just spot it in and it'll work because it's query based, which is probably what your application is already. So it's very good for that. Obviously, if your preferred uh, style of coding is using queries, um, then Data Manager is, is the fit you want. Um, and um, I'd say there's slightly less overhead to using Data Manager than there is with um, ORM, but to be honest, I get asked a lot about the overhead of ORM, and I've not really ever noticed a massive overhead. Um, so yeah, I, mean, I think it largely depends on your style of coding as to which one you prefer. Great. Uh, and what about uh, people who are allergic to object orientation? Uh, is Data Manager a good choice for them? Yes. <laughs> One way to answer. <laughs> Great. Um, got, uh, someone is asking, will we uh, distribute the presentation after the, uh, after the webinar is over? And I seem to remember you uh, have just put that URL up there. It's not currently on the screen. Mm -hmm. So yes, the URL is up on screen. Um, I don't know if you can put it in the chat or panel or something. Um, I think Michael, you're also recording it, so if people want to watch it again, um, then please do. Yep. But we, yes, the, the slides are up there now, and actually the slides you saw were actually served from that website, so that is what you saw, even with the broken image at the end. Great. Um, Sydney uh, Wing is asking, uh, what if your application has multiple data sources? Yep. Um, for that, uh, CodeFusion ORM does support data, multiple data sources, so that is something you can do. Um, you choose which uh, CFCs match which data source, is kind of how it works. Um, with Data Manager, you can always spin up two different instances of Data Manager and one map to each DSM. That would be a way of doing it. Um, if you want to try and cross-query on two different data sources, then you're going to have problems. I don't, I don't think you'll be able to do that. Um, I've got a question from uh, Savan uh, Kumar who's asking about joins and other conditions. Um, how do you apply those to the updates and deletes? The examples you had uh, didn't have any query condition in there. For the ORM stuff or for the manager? Um, I think it was um, for, I, I don't know, maybe you can answer for ORM. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's, that's a fair comment. It, my example is very simple because I basically wanted to cover CRUD, so it's uh, the simple operations. Um, ORM allows you to um, have, if you want, huge object graphs in memory um, all pulled up. So what you can do is you can have one CFC and then you can define different relationships between them. So you can have um, a one-to-many or a many-to-one or a many-to-many. Many. Um, and what Hibernate will do underneath the hood is it will, when you load an object, you can get it to load all the associated objects that go with it as well. Um, so it handles all that for you. Um, and with the cascading strategies I mentioned briefly, you can actually get it to, um, when you update objects, to cascade down the tree. Data Manager has um, support joins between tables, so um, you will need to do some uh, defining of your database, some mapping. 
so the data managers knows how it all fits together. Um, but what you can then do is you can load up a table and it will load up associated data to go with it as well. So both of them kind of support it. Great. Um, I've got a question from Paul Barber. He's saying that the other tedious aspect of database interface as well as CRUD is the creation of the input form, which is arguably even more onerous than doing the queries. Uh, what scaffolding solutions are available for that? Okay, that's a good question. Um, Steve has some tools on his blog which um, integrate with Data Manager. Um, some of them, so you might want to have go and have a look at that. Uh, just done a nice little suite of products that all kind of fit together. Um, in terms of ORM, then um, one of the Cold Fusion advantages, Terry Ryan, has actually built a, um, a Cold Fusion built a plugin called Aptacular, which will actually go off and introspect an existing database and build all the scaffolding for you. So that's quite a good way of getting started. And recently, Lewis Mahano, who's a um, guy behind Coldbox, has released a project which off the top of my head is called DataBoss, which does something very similar. Um, I haven't actually used that one, but it looks like quite a promising project, so I, I go and have a look at those. So um, Jamie Jackson's asking if you have a modern uh, version of Cold Fusion, and I guess uh, they mean either CF9 or 10, would, would you choose CFORM or Data Manager for a new project? Um, I would choose ORM. Um, but that's not to say that I don't use exclusively ORM in it. Um, like I said, I still use queries and things like that. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's just my personal choice. Uh, but it kind of depends on your coding style. But certainly don't rule out either just because of if you have tried. Um, now, we've got someone who has a lot of uh, database updates and users need to see data in real time. Um, how does ORM or uh, Data Manager alleviate stress on the database in that kind of scalability situation? Okay, by real time, are you talking about, if you're talking about to the millisecond, then basically the only way of getting data, live data, is by constantly querying the database. Um, there's no real way of paying that. Um, if you're talking about um, having a sort of sensible level of real-time data, um, then both um, Data Manager has a smart cache feature, which will do a certain level of caching for you. Um, what ORM has is it has a whole layer of um, using something called the first level cache by default, which basically means if you pull out the same bit of data in the same request, it actually doesn't hit the database again. It knows it's already loaded it. So you can actually save yourself some um, SQL statements, um, and you don't have to do anything special for that, it'll just do it, it'll go, hey, I've already unloaded that object, I don't need to get it again. If you want to do something more sophisticated, then you can um, cache it for longer periods of time, say a minute, 30 seconds like that, that's quite a good way of reducing SQL statements, um, but still having pretty much near real-time data. Um, so yeah, it uses the second level cache, which is a, a feature which you can use, and that's based on EH cache. Um, but yeah, definitely often have a look at those. But equally, if you're using Data Manager, there's nothing to say you can't cache the record set you get from Data Manager in the um, second level cache, but in the EH cache anyway. Great. So, you've all got. so um, we, we do have a few more questions, and we have some time for those, but I wanted to ask uh, folks what kind of problems they're seeing overall uh, in their database uh, issues. So uh, if you want to respond to the survey, um, whether it's time writing CRUD code or slow queries, or maybe when your schema changes it takes too much time to update the code, or error handling, or maybe you're more concerned about uh, hackers getting in through poor SQL uh, and security concerns. So, uh, if you want to fill out uh, what's important to you, uh, what issues you're seeing in your database coding, uh, that, I think, will be uh, interesting. I'm going to close the poll in uh, three, two, one, last chance to vote. And uh, let's see. Well, it looks like uh, time writing crowd is definitely a, a point for about two-thirds of people, but a significant number of people concerned about hacking and error handling. And that makes me ask uh, a question, John. Um, how do uh, data manager and ORM deal with errors in the database? 
Um, they throw their errors. It's as simple as that. So it comes, um, it trickles back up to your code, and you can handle yes. it however you want. Yes, and um, I'd certainly say that the error messages you get in Hibernate can certainly be more obscure than they are in Data Manager because it's talking to a, a third-level Java library, so the error messages are thrown by Java library and then trickled up. So you get some sort of kind of strange ones from time to time, whereas Data Manager, because it's based on CF Query, it would be much more familiar the error messages. Um, but that's not to say that you can't solve them. And there's, um, the Google group I mentioned earlier, there's lots and lots of people who've posted their error messages over time, so I'm sure if you pretty much search for your error message, you would, you would likely get an answer. Okay. Okay. So I wouldn't choose between them based on the number of error messages. Again. Okay. Well, it's good to know that you can handle the errors in your own way in the code. Um, got someone yes, who, up, yeah. who who was using ORM and they ran into a problem where it wasn't rolling back a transaction after a SQL error had occurred. I don't know if you have any thoughts on transaction handling in ORM. Yeah, transactions change between ColdFusion 9 and ColdFusion 9.01, um, which does have a slight confusion. I would definitely recommend you go for 9.01 because basically they listen to um, some very smart people in our community who basically said do it a different way and they listened and they did it. Um, if you wrap transaction blocks around then um, I can't see why it would be failing to roll back. I haven't seen that. The only thing to be aware of is that like I said if you um, pull an object out of the database and then update it it will automatically try and uh, save it back to the database. So the errors that I have seen are um, Hibernate tries to do a best guess of when to save that data. So sometimes you get slightly odd things going on when you've got relationships. Um, so there is a, a little bit of um, uh, learning curve and teething pains, but it's yeah, worth, worth fighting the way through it. And one of the things people are interested in is uh, keeping the code base in line with database changes. So if you if a field name changes, how does that, uh, you know, does that automatically get dealt with by these tools, or is there something you still have to change in the code to deal with that? Um, with Data Manager, um, in the examples I showed, if you're not doing any of the sort of schema creation stuff, then Data Manager will basically, when it's instantiated, uh, which is what I did now get in CFC, it will basically go off and introspect the database, and so it will find anything you've got. Uh, the one caveat to that is obviously if you've got lots of code that's referencing a uh, database column that suddenly then disappears or renames, then obviously it won't know magically how you've renamed your column. Um, it, it can't read your mind? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, with ORM, then um, you have got a slight level of safety in, uh, in my code example where I was mapping the properties in the CFC to the database column, then the column name is independent of the property name. So you can change the column name in your database, update your CFC's reference, but still refer to the property name in your code. Um, so that does give you a little bit of leeway, but it's not a very common problem. Um, but yeah, if, if that's something that happens a lot, then I guess ORM kind of helps you with that. It may not be a problem when you're working just with yourself and you're, you're your own DBA, but when you've got multiple people on a team, sometimes other people will change field names without telling you. I, I don't know if that's ever right. happened to okay. you, but I've certainly <laughs> seen that happen. <laughs> okay. Which, yes, I've been lucky to avoid it. Yeah. Uh, which brings me to the next question. Are there any benefits to using ORM or Data Manager if you, you're doing team development? Yes, I would say. Um, the advantage basically is that it's a standard way of working, and this applies to both data manager and ORM. Because you're using a third-party tool which has a defined API, everyone has to use it this, um, by API, I mean how you talk to it. Um, everyone has to work the same way. So it's easy for you to go and look at someone's code and you can see if it's using data manager, it's using get records and the second document it's a struct, you know exactly what it has to doing. Same applies to ORM. If you see a call to entity led by PK, you know it's getting that entity from the database with that ID. So yes, it's definitely worth doing. As I said, because you're using um, third-party tools, all the bugs have been ironed out for you. 
So you're not having to sit there fixing someone's uh, read statement because they you know, got syntax wrong or something like that. Um, that's all done for you. So yes, I definitely recommend it for team environment. And it's all documented as well, obviously. Great. Um, George Murphy's uh, letting us, he's got a question, he's also got a comment, he says Codebox also supports scaffolding for those people who want to have their forms automatically generated. And then he's asking, have you ever used ORM and Data Manager together in the same application? I haven't, no. Um, however, um, I, I did think of a situation recently where that would actually be the case. Um, I don't know if anyone actually reads my blog, but recently I did a post about using um, an iterator pattern uh, to load in sort of pseudo objects. Um, the idea is that ORM, the problem with ORM, if there is a problem, is that it can start spinning up lots and lots of SDR statements without you knowing it, because it's kind of all under the hood and hidden away. So, what you need to be a bit careful for, and I recommend to everyone, is you can turn on something called SPR logging, where you can see the SPR statements being run. And so if your beautiful page that you think is fantastic is suddenly running 100 queries, then that's probably something you need to go and look at. So uh, Data Manager is very fast because it uses query record sets. It hits the database once, it creates a query um, object and returns it. Whereas with ORM, you may find you're getting one SPR statement being executed for each row. Um, by default, it won't do that, but there's certain ways of setting it up so it does. So it's just something to be aware of. Um, and if you are doing that, then you might find that there's certain things that you don't want the overhead of creating lots of objects. So you know, data manager is great for just getting out record sets. Um, got a question from uh, Mark Leo Russell. Russell is asking, can data manager ORM work with a non-relational database, like for example a graph database? Um, no, it's designed for mapping to, I mean, particularly with Hibernate, the goal for it is to solve something called the impedance mismatch, uh, which is a, a great name, which basically means that objects don't directly map to a database, to a relational database. So, I mean, its goal is to work with relational databases, and Data Manager is pretty much designed to do the same thing. So, if you're using, you know, MongoDB or something like that, then no, they're not the tool to use. Okay. Um, Paul Barber is asking, uh, do you have any thoughts on uh, SQL injection vulnerability uh, with either ORM or Data Manager? Do they help protect against that in any way? Uh, yes, they both do. Um, the examples I've shown um, use the equivalent of CF Query Param um, to stop anything happening. If you are with ORM using HQL, then HQL you can still get SQL injection attacks. Um, uh, did try and break it, and it's very hard to actually break it, uh, even if you try. But basically, if you pass everything in as parameters, as you should be with your SQL statements, then you're fine. Great. And Chuck uh, is asking, are there any uh, complicated, are complicated queries any easier to manage or comprehend in ORM than if you just wrote the raw SQL? I'd say if you're doing complicated queries, which is usually if you're doing things like um, building reports and things like that, um, it's like guessing you there, but um, then you're probably better off using SQL just because it will be more efficient. Um, building a rich um, domain layer, um, kind of building your business logic all in objects to build a report is kind of overkill. So I, I just stick with SQL. So really these things are for helping re eliminate CRUD and not to deal with reporting? Um, I certainly wouldn't say they're strength for reporting, no. They're to deal with getting data in and out of databases. CRUD is the, you know, the thing that they're the best at, but certainly with um, ORM, then the object class is quite useful because you can, uh, for instance, load, um, it's like I was working on an e-commerce site today, where you can load in a product, and then once the product's loaded, I can just call a method on it called get um, selling options, and it will just go off and return an array of all the selling options. So I don't have to go and write a separate uh, query or anything to get those selling options. So I can just call it and hibernate will go off and get it and populate it and return it for me. So it certainly speeds up the development of your applications. Um, but just be aware that not everything should be built using it. 
Um, and Clyde Conway is asking, would Data Manager allow you to select data from Access and then insert it into a SQL Server? Yes, you would have to set up two different data sources. Um, Steve might have a better answer than this. Um, but I would thought you could certainly um, use one instance of Data Manager, which is pointing at the Access database to load the data, and then you would just um, use the second instance of Data Manager to insert it into the database. Um, the other thing that Data Manager does, which is quite a neat trick, and LRM does as well, is because their database is agnostic, you can actually write the code. Um, for instance, you may on your local machine have um, uh, MySQL running locally, or even something like an in-memory database, like um, H2 or something like that. Um, and then on production, you're obviously running Oracle and things like that. Because there are kind of a layer of abstraction between them, then you can write for one database engine but deploy using another. And I, I see Steve Bryant, who wrote Data Manager, said that uh, he has a data sync project that you can grab that uh, demonstrates doing that. So, um. I knew there was something. I can remember. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. <laughs> so uh, we just have a few more questions before we uh, wrap up. Um, George Murphy is asking: uh, Is it possible to persist objects in Data Manager? Uh, what do you mean by persist? I mean, obviously, persist in the database. You can. Um, if you wanted to load up record sets and store them in memory, then you would just use the caching capabilities of Cold Fusion. And uh, I have a question from Raoul who's asking, uh, he said, I started working on an uh, ORM using CF9, and every time I made a change on the mapping, why do I need to restart the service to have it make effect? Uh, you shouldn't need to restart the service. Um, what you will need to do is call something called ORM reload, um, and that basically is telling Cold Fusion and Hibernate that there's a change to be made to your mappings, and it needs to go off and look at it all again. Um, so basically that goes off and does. Because obviously you can't do that on every request because you'd have a massive overhead if it went off and looked at your database each time at the same time you price data. Um, so I would be surprised you had to start a service unless you're caching your CFCs. Um, certainly there's an option in uh, Cold Fusion where you can um, ask it not to cache any CFCs, um, which on production you tend to turn on. So it means it doesn't have to compile into the job all the time. Um, so it might be that. But certainly our and reload 99% of the time should solve that problem. Great. Um, final question. Uh, are there any recommended frameworks or libraries to use when you're using ORM? Um, no, there aren't. Um, certainly, I use something called Validate This for validation. Um, and that is very, very useful because it writes the client-side validation scripts using jQuery plugins and also the server-side validation. Um, but equally, that can work with structs as well as objects, so you could use it for data manager as well. Um, Coldbox has a quite impressive little um, selection of tools for helping you with ORM. So if you're a Coldbox fan, definitely go and check out um, stuff that Lewis and the team have done. Um, there's various help methods that help with ORM. Um, and then there's the other ones I mentioned before, like Aptacular, if you want to do scaffolding, or go and look at Steve's um, little library tools if you want to use data management. Great. Well, I uh, really appreciate uh, your presentation and all the in-depth answers you've given, John. Um, if people are interested in their book, they can go to your website, alaspaulyorick.com, um, and you've put the presentation up there as well. Um, we will send out a survey email to hear how people thought things went, and I'll share that back with you, John. Um, and thanks everyone for yeah. So thanks everyone for attending, and uh, have a great rest of your day. Okay, thank you everyone.